Rights Conference on the Human Rights Situation in Iran, answering the Iranian people's call for human rights. As we gather here today, the human rights situation in Iran continues to deteriorate. According to the International Campaign for Human Rights in Iran, in the first month of 2011, on average, the Iranian government executed a person every eight hours. In most of these cases, if not all, the right to due process and access to lawyers were not upheld. And in many cases, the lawyers of the victims and their families were not informed of the execution until after the fact. Meanwhile, several former members, former leaders of the Baha'i community in Iran continue to linger in jail after enduring a trial riddled with uh, irregularities and receiving lengthy jail terms without having actually been informed of the actual sentence in writing. Just a few days ago, one of these elderly leaders of the Baha'i community, his wife, passed away. Yet he was not permitted to attend the funeral of his wife for 50 years. At the same time, as we all know, in the aftermath of the Iranian elections in 2009, thousands of protesters were rounded up, put in jail, for having demanded their rights. Some of them have been executed. Others have been tortured and raped in jail, and yet others were killed while being tortured in jail. According to Amnesty International, the human rights situation in Iran is as bad now as it has been in the last 20 years. What has been missing, however, is an international response to the increasingly uh, abysmal human rights situation in that country. Over the years, we have heard a lot about Iran's obligations under the Non-Proliferation uh, non Treaty. Clearly, those rights and obligations are real, but those are not the only obligations. Iran, as a signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and as a party to numerous human rights conventions, also has obligations to uphold the human rights of its people. And the international community has an obligation to hold Iran to those obligations. Resolutions have been passed at the UN, but there has been no clear effort to create a mechanism to address and end these human rights abuses. Some opportunities have been lost, and some opportunities can still be seized upon. One such opportunity is a resolution sponsored by the Swedish government at the Human Rights uh, committee in uh, council in Geneva in the next few days that will put into place a monitor for uh, following and addressing the human rights situation in Iran. Today, we have some of the foremost experts, thinkers, and practitioners with us to address this issue and discuss the best ways, the most efficient ways, of dealing with the human rights situation in Iran, including Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Suzanne Nossel, Ambassador Jonas Hofström from Sweden, uh, Congressman Keith Ellison, who is the leading sponsor of the Stand with the Iranian People Act, uh, as well as New York Times, former New York Times Iran correspondent, Nazir al -Fart. But first, we have a panel with Sarah Wixon from Human Rights Watch, Ali Reza Nader from Bran, and Professor Nader Hashimi from the University of Denver to address the current state of human rights in Iran and the Green Movement and the pro-democracy movement. But before we go there, let me also thank the sponsors of the conference today whose generous support has made this a possibility. And those include the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Plowshares Fund, the Iranian American community, and many other private donors there, as well as Connect US, and of course, Senator Carl Levin, who was kind enough to sponsor the room that we are in today. So let me jump over to the other seat and start the conversation with our panelists. We are delighted Islam and Human Rights. He's a professor um, at uh, University of Denver and just recently came out with a very, very highly acclaimed book on the Green Movement in Iran, uh, co-edited it, People Reloaded, The Green Movement and the Struggle for Iran's Future. You probably have seen him on PBS NewsHour, on CNN, on many other uh, networks in the last couple of days alone. We also have with us Ali Reza Nader from Rand Corporation, 
was written extensively uh, on the situation in Iran. Just came out of with a monograph on the succession uh, situation in Iran and is also currently working on a broader piece uh, uh, regarding a broader comprehensive policy on Iran together with other people at Brown. We are also very delighted to have with us here right next to me, Sarah Whitson from Human Rights Watch, who of course is one of the leading organizations working on this issue um, and has been a force for human rights in the Middle East as whole, but particularly on Iran, particularly at this very, very sensitive time. So, without any further ado, let me get straight to the situation. I have a conversation with you about the situation uh, on human rights. And I would like to first ask, what exactly is being done by the international community to address the human rights situation in Iran? What is happening at the Human Rights Council? And what are the different steps that the United States can take to be supportive of this? Let's start with you, sir. Uh, sure. Um, I think the main emphasis right now is at the Human Rights Council, which is really the proper place for uh, action to be taken on urgent uh, human rights crises and situations. Um, and that is the uh, proposal to have a special rapporteur on Iran appointed in the Swedish resolution, proposed resolution that you just mentioned. Um, I think that uh, uh, both because of the deteriorating situation, the ongoing deteriorating situation in Iran, as well as a sense that this is a different moment in the Middle East, um, the chances of uh, such a special rapporteur uh, for Iran being appointed is uh, much better now, today, this year, than it was last year. Um, because I think that there is a greater willingness on the part of the international community to uh, treat very seriously what you know, is not new in Iran, um, but we are seeing spreading in a, in a much uh, a broader way. Uh, and I think that the role of the special rapporteur would be you know, very important to document and keep focused on uh, uh, what's happening in Iran and to force the Human Rights Council to deal with that situation. Uh, I think that the break uh, of uh, the coalition of uh, Arab states uh, represents a big opportunity in that regard. The fact that we can no longer uh, expect uh, that Egypt and Tunisia will naturally stand against uh, efforts to uh, shine a light on abuses in the Middle East, particularly Iranian ones, um, is a very important development in that regard. Uh, and I think that similarly, the action of uh, uh, the African states um, on Libya uh, it creates an important you know, precedent to remind them of, of how they must also act on Iran. Um, finally, I think the focus uh, in terms of uh, important actors in the international community, I'm not addressing all of your questions, um, you know, the microphone, um, is to focus specifically on uh, Brazil, South Africa, uh, uh, and their role, their special relationship with Iran, uh, to put increasing pressure on them to act consistently with their state and values uh, in support of human rights. I think they uh, can play a much, much more important role, both at the Human Rights Council, but also in terms of their own statements and their own interventions uh, on Iran, so that Iran recognizes that it is an outlier and it has few friends to count on uh, given its conduct. Um, Trina, I just wanted to add um, that one of the things that the international community can do or should do with respect to the situation of human rights in Iran is to really um, shine a global spotlight on those human rights violations. Up until now, the spotlight on Iran has not been on human rights, it's been on nuclear weapons. And the Iranian regime loves to talk about nuclear weapons. It loves to talk about Israel. Uh, it loves to talk about Ahmadinejad's views on the Holocaust. What it does not want to talk about is the state of human rights in its country. So by shining the global spotlight and shifting the conversation in that direction, I think it advances the cause for human rights. It makes the Iranian regime very comfortable. Just picking up on the point that Sarah mentioned, now that the politics of the Middle East has shifted in many ways, toward the direction of democracy and human rights. This has put the issue of human rights and democracy on the agenda. And so the, the statements by the Iranian regime, by the leaders of the Iranian regime, can now be used, I think, to advance the cause of human rights. Just yesterday, Iran's foreign minister, Salahi, said that the Bahraini authorities should, review, should avoid using violence and force against the population, adding that Iran expects the Bahraini government to be wise in responding to the demands of the protesters and respecting their rights. So if the rights of the Bahraini people should be respected, why not the rights of the Iranian people? Mm -hmm. What exactly would 
human rights monitor to do? What are the mechanisms that it puts in place that enables the spotlight to be on Iran, that enables other types of avenues to open up to not only shame, but also really see significant progress on the human rights? What are the mechanisms that this entails? Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, it's really open-ended, but the, the, the you know, our mandated responsibility would be to uh, document violations and abuses of rights uh, in uh, Iran, obviously to ask for a visit to Iran, which I'm sure the government will decline, um, and then to present a report to the Human Rights Council that would have to be reviewed at a special session, since it's a special rapporteur. Um, the uh, uh, special rapporteur can then make several recommendations, as other rapporteurs have, or as other special sessions of the Human Rights Council have, um, that, you know, for uh, can equal, uh, or, or at least come close to, what international action has been taken uh, on Libya. We can uh, uh, recommend that the Security Council or the Human Rights Council appoint a commission of inquiry, which the Human Rights Council is authorized to do. Um, they can urge the Security Council to refer uh, Iran uh, to the International Criminal Court for prosecution, um, as they have with uh, uh, Libya. They can make several recommendations, which of course it will then depend on the international community to effectuate. Um, but uh, two easy things that don't need to wait for uh, uh, the special rapporteur's report uh, and the mechanisms and wheels of the UN attorney um, are for other nations to adopt the same kind of asset freeze uh, and targeted uh, sanctions against leading uh, Iranian government officials who were directly culpable in human rights abuses uh, to make it increasingly uncomfortable for leading Iranian government officials to live life uh, as they used to in ordinary course and, and to travel to Europe and to travel to other parts of the world um, without sanction or penalty. I think that they have to understand that there's a direct consequence to them. And one very important message that's not just relevant, I think, for Iran, but for, in this particular moment in time, for government officials in, in, in the Middle East, probably in Uzbekistan and a lot of other places who are thinking about What's at stake for them is to make them understand that they too will face jail and prosecution, that there is that risk for them, and that they need to really think hard, is it worth it? Is it worth following these orders uh, that are being given to me if there is a risk of real international censure? And that is really the power of, of an ICC type of thorough work we should be for it. you've been writing a lot about um, the pro-democracy movement. What do you, how do you think their perspective would be on this. It seems like this is one of the things that they have put on their list of uh, wishes from the West. I, I think now they made a very important point that focus, the U.S. focus and the international focus has been on the nuclear program. Uh, specifically, sanctions have been seen as a way to pressure the Iranian regime, to split uh, the Iranian regime from the population. And there's evidence to suggest that sanctions actually can be counterproductive in achieving U.S. goals uh, vis-a-vis the nuclear program. Uh, there's broad support within uh, Iran uh, on the nuclear program for the civilian aspect, and there's circumstantial evidence to suggest that the population or a significant section would even support uh, weaponization, perhaps. And we have to see why Iranians feel this way. It's a very nationalistic <coughs> country. Um, the poor uh, state of relations between the U.S. and Iran basically constrain our ability to use sanctions and uh, other coercive measures uh, to affect the population. I think there's a realization in the United States that uh, the nuclear program in a lot of ways is uh, continuing, um, it's facing obstacles, but we're not managing to stop. And so if we focus on human rights, I think this is an issue that Iranians can relate to. They can see that uh, the United States and its allies are not just concerned about the nuclear program, which has brought support again in Iran, but that they care about average, ordinary Iranians, uh, despite sanctions hurting the Iranian population. And this is something the Green Movement has also emphasized, individual uh, human rights within Iran. And I think the Iranian government is very vulnerable uh, to this sort of pressure, because it can deflect some of the nuclear pressure, even within uh, inter the international community, a lot of the non-aligned countries might relate uh, to Iran's nuclear drive, but I think human rights is an entirely different issue, especially with uh, what's going on in the world today. Sometimes when I Yeah, I just wanted to add to that that um, one of the really constructive things that the international community can do to promote human rights is to um, go beyond simply talking about human rights in Iran in sort of a direct, general, abstract fashion, and to have prominent voices in the international community. UN Secretary General, 
President Barack Obama, um, leading um, heads of state of European countries to start naming names, to start familiarizing and introducing the names of heroic human rights defenders to the international community. So it's important that names such as Emonadine Bawi, Nasrina Setude, Mansura Osambu, Majida Tabakoli, um, Abdullah Momini, um, that these names, these heroic sort of human rights defenders who were in Iran, were all sort of um, um, brought before a sort of a very kangaroo court and subjected to sort of a, a fake and fraud, fraudulent trial and now were languishing in prison, that the names of these individuals you know, become household names in the same way that during the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, names such as Stephen Biko, Walter Sisulu, Nelson Mandela, Al Oliver Tamble became household names in terms of global public opinion. Once, you know, if, if for example, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton or President Obama were to mention the name, you know, Imanadine Balki, that puts his name in the global spot and it makes it much more difficult for the Iranian regime to ignore the plight of those political prisoners. When an Iranian representative comes abroad and is sort of being interviewed, let's say, on CNN, it's important that you know the media and reporters familiarize themselves with the case, the case profiles of these individuals and ask specific and pointed questions. Why is, for example, the famous filmmaker, Jack Adepanoi, why is he in jail? Why is he banned from making films? Why is someone like, you know, um, you know, the prominent student leader of the Romani, why is he in jail? On what charge? What is he? And sort of, you know, we, 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 to use a basketball analogy, we engage in a full court press, press this question and shame the Iranian regime um, with respect to their internal human rights record. Uh, I'm just to interview one on another caution because um, uh, there's danger that uh, being seen, particularly the U.S. being seen to instrumentalize uh, Iran's human rights record because it's not otherwise working to talk about the nuclear issue and this is a backdoor way of isolating Iran. And I think uh, that would be dangerous and, and it would, I think, actually fail. And to that end, it's incredibly important for the U.S. to be consistent in its voice and to treat all of the actors in the Middle East the same with respect to their human rights abuses, with respect to their violations of international military law. Um, so to that end, uh, the U.S. actions on, on Egypt and, and uh, uh, Libya and Tunisia have been very, very important, but at the same time, it will be very hard for the U.S. to take a leadership position um, when it continues to, for example, veto a resolution uh, at the Security Council uh, recognizing and reiterating the illegality of settlements. That is uh, something that can very, very easily be used by the Iranian government to dismiss all of uh, uh, the U.S. stated concerns about human rights in Iran if there are if there is evidence of double standards, and sadly, that veto is a very, very important a uh, persistent example of double standards with that one actor that Ahmadinejad wants to talk about. Um, the second, I guess, is just uh, for that reason and for the reason that we can't expect uh, uh, a perfect consistency yet, unfortunately, in U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, um, is that there need to be other voices and other actors, as uh, Nadia was just mentioning. Um, and to that end, we should push, as I mentioned again, uh, Brazil and South Africa, who are not doing their share, who are not speaking out uh, on Iran's record, and they have an incredibly important role to play. Um, but also now looking for other uh, uh, Muslim states uh, who can talk about uh, the abuses of other Muslims. And I think, again, I mean, it's a lot to dump on Egypt and Tunisia at this moment in time, but they have said that their foreign policy is going to change. Uh, and they have said that they are going to play a more constructive role at the UN and the Human Rights Council, and they can and should be leaders now uh, on this issue in that region <coughs> in particular. We've been mentioning the nuclear issue, and oftentimes in Washington when there's a conversation about this, and I think it was a little bit hinted to here as well, there is a sentiment that the human rights issue and the nuclear issue are at competition with each other for attention and priority. Um, at the same time, in the past, the United States has been quite capable of being able to address a significant security issue, while at the same time not neglecting or at a minimum bringing attention to the human rights issue as well, and we saw that during the Cold War. And there was, I know you're working on a manuscript that is talking about this. Is there readiness for this? Are we of a different generation? Is it an MTV generation? We can only focus on one thing at a time. Why has it been so difficult? And what can be done? to make sure that there's, these two issues are not viewed to be in competition with each other. 
I don't think it's that the two issues are in competition with each other. It just the fact that the focus has been on the nuclear program, uh, the potential danger that a nuclear armed regime can pose to U.S. interests in the region and the interest of our allies. So I think that takes away attention away from uh, other forms or other strategies regarding Iran. And when um, the Obama administration tried to tackle the Iranian nuclear issue, uh, there was an understanding that perhaps through engagement and other course of measures like sanctions that we could uh, reach a solution. Uh, and there was a tendency to de-emphasize internal issues in Iran because then the Iranian government could claim that was interference in Iran's affairs. We're trying to sit down with the Iranian government uh, at the same table and treat it to a certain extent as uh, not an equal partner, but a uh, you know, peer, somebody we can talk to. So I think interfering in Iran's internal affairs uh, was seen as uh, basically weakening that strategy. And if you remember after the 2009 presidential election in Iran, there was a lot of hesitancy in the United States to directly criticize uh, Iranian government actions. And I think that's changed uh, to a certain extent because, again, our strategy with Iran in a lot of ways is uh, not going anywhere due to uh, the Iranian government for the most part, I think, and their issues on this side as well, but also what's going on in the Middle East. We've seen uh, popular uprisings over through the Tunisian and Egyptian government. Uh, other governments are in trouble. So I think the will and needs of the population in any country uh, matter a lot. It's not just uh, us dealing with the regime specifically and ignoring the population. And I think now there's a hope that uh, a similar movement can take place. I'm not necessarily talking about a regime change, but that uh, the Iranian people, uh, because of their dissatisfaction with the system, can affect change in a way that's uh, amenable to U.S. interests. Um, I, I would just add that this um, uh, relationship between um, Iran's nuclear program and its human rights record, um, uh, I think the linkages between the two are much more intertwined if viewed in its proper perspective. I think to sort of view them separately I think misreads how we can resolve both of these questions. And, and so I'm of the view that, um, you know, current international policy, U.S. policy with respect to Iran on this nuclear program has not made and will not make any significant headway in terms of getting Iran to shift course. The only uh, way of advancing Iranian regime uh, behavior on the nuclear question and getting it to change is to really highlight and press the human rights slash democracy issue. That's where the regime is really vulnerable. Um, and, um, you know, if, if, if that were to become the focus of international policy, where the focus and the spotlight is highlighted not only the human rights abuses, but also the, dem the democratic sort of abuses that are taking place. Iran likes to claim that they have free and fair elections, that they have a free press. We all know that's fraudulent. But by focusing and by advancing and by calibrating, I think, the international policy, where the question of democracy is front and center. And now I think it's much more easier to do that because of events in North Africa. Now democracy is on the agenda across the region. And if U.S. foreign policy were to, I think, realize that this represents a significant qualitative shift in the politics of the region, I think it can also utilize um, this new reality as a way of advancing its policy toward Iran, which will also have consequences for um, those aspects of the Iranian government with, uh, specifically on the nuclear question that is so troubling to the international community. Now, you know, what policy specifically should be, you know, adopted, you know, there's room for debate here, but I think, you know, in, broad, in a broad measure, just focusing and highlighting the abuses of the regime with respect to human rights, its democratic, um, 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 really fraudulent elections that take place, and, uh, and by just making that sort of the anchor of international policy, I think is one way of solving those issues. A lot of the conversation here has been what can be done through the international uh, mechanism, multilateral human rights uh, council. Um, there's some critics who view a lot of these different entities as not being efficient, perhaps having other types of problems. Certain countries have been elected to them. Um, what would the alternative be? And also, what is the perspective of the pro democracy and the human rights defenders inside of Iran on these specific issues? One alternative is, to a certain extent, I think Iran can be dismissive of uh, international uh, forums and say, well, this is the West uh, construct, the West controls the international system. But I think if you target Iran's key partners in terms of human rights, and we're talking about countries like 
China, Russia, India, uh, countries that Iran does trade with, countries that invest in Iran, uh, countries that haven't necessarily adhered to sanctions or enforced sanctions. I think that is a possible avenue. And a lot of these countries themselves are vulnerable to human rights, as we saw in China in the past few weeks. They've been worried about their own population uh, rising against the government um, because they've been inspired, you know, some segments of the population have been inspired by the Arab uh, uprisings. And the Iranian government tends to be dismissive of human rights pressures, but they have a relatively uh, influential figure, uh, Mohammad Darjani, responsible for the human rights in Iran. And I think it seems like his major job is to basically defend the regime uh, time after time after time. Uh, so there is this vulnerability because the Islamic Republic, though it is a militarized and uh, autocratic system of government, is still vulnerable to human rights. I mean, th this smear of being a human rights violator, I think, will have an effect not just on Iran, but its relations with some of these other major countries. But precisely because of the fact that many of the countries that are in the Security Council, that are in the Human Rights Council, are themselves violators, would the United States be more effective? working more alone on these issues, or does it have to go through the international system? And again, what are the perspectives of human rights defenders in Iran on this issue? Yeah. How do they view it? Yeah. Let me speak to the second question in terms of what human rights activists within Iran want from the international community, from the United States, in terms of advancing the agenda of human rights. <clears throat> um, Iran, Iran's Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Shirin Ebadi, has written and consistently said if the international community can get together at the UN Security Council and sanction Iran over its nuclear program, why can't it do the same thing when it comes to human rights? And so that's point number one. But let me just tell a story here from one of the leading sort of prominent uh, defenders of human rights, um, a heroic figure in the struggle for human rights and democracy in Iran, a man by the name of Akbar Ganji. Akbar Ganji is Iran's, one of Iran's leading dissidents. He was in jail for six years, you know, recipient of dozens of human rights awards. And he currently is in the United States. When he came to the United States in 2006, I invited him to speak at Northwestern University, where I was teaching at the time. And I was translating for him when, when reporters were asking him this precise question. What can the United States do uh, to support the struggle for democracy and human rights in Iran? And he, and he, and he responded, uh, absolutely nothing. This is an internal struggle. This is an internal sort of uh, issue. The Iranians have to figure it out for themselves. But then he was sort of pressed on the issue. Surely there's some concrete measure that the United States can adopt in terms of its foreign policy toward Iran, toward the region, that can advance the cause of human rights. And Akbar Gandhi stopped for a moment. He paused and he thought and he said, you know what? There is something concrete that the United States can do that would be a huge boon of support for human rights defenders and pro democracy activists within Iran. And that is help resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict. Because the Israel-Palestine conflict, according to Akbar Ganji, fuels Islamic fundamentalism in the region, gives an excuse to authoritarian regimes in the region, such as Iran, to shift the public discussion away from their own internal bankrupt and corrupt rule and focusing on the plight of the Palestinians. And so his point was, and again, this is not coming from me, this is coming from one of the leading human rights defenders in Iran, saying that there is a linkage between regional developments, such as the Israel-Palestine conflict, and the persistence of authoritarianism in the region. And so he was saying that if the United States and the international community, by extension, were to advance that issue, it would the, one of the ripple effects, the positive ripple effects, would that it, would that it would strengthen the struggle for democracy and human rights within Iran. Just to challenge you a little bit on that, um, some of those groups that have worked very, very hard on getting a monitor, I think the Democracy Coalition Project uh, really needs to get a lot of credit for the work that they've done. Also point out, though, that it's not until the United States willing to put its weight behind, even if it's not the lead sponsor, that anything will happen in so it sounds to me that the U.S. nevertheless have other options to do, uh, to pursue, that just sitting back and resolving other issues is not sufficient. Yeah, but the way you posed the question was, you know, well, uh, the U.N., the international community on the one hand versus uh, the U.S. acting on the other hand. Um, and I think the U.S. leaving alone on this uh, won't work uh, because of the political dimensions of the conflict. Uh, uh, political conflict uh, with Iran, but what will work is the U.S. getting behind or, or taking a leadership role, certainly, uh, of an international effort at the Human Rights Council uh, and uh, potentially at the Security Council. For all its ills, for all its slowness, it's the institution that's there now that's able to act 
now, uh, and that's able to have legitimacy and credibility outside the United States, not just inside the United States. And I think it does matter to Iran, its standing, and these international bodies. It very much wanted to get a seat at the Human Rights Council, uh, and I think that uh, international human rights organizations, uh, as well as Iranian human rights activists, successfully uh, led a campaign to make sure that didn't happen. Nevertheless, it has a seat on the UN uh, Women's Rights Council, and that's the name of the new body established, um, which is shameful and scandalous, and unfortunately you can't be removed from it, like uh, Libya was just removed from the Human Rights Council. Um, uh, but there, the, these things do matter to them. And in terms of Iranian activists, you know, the reason Sharon Abadi has spent so much time in Geneva is because that's also where she's looking for action. Um, in order to be persuasive uh, in terms of affecting what's happening in Iran, it has to be international, it has to have global credibility. Instead of answering your question, I want to pose several other questions. I think that's just easier to do. I think anything the U.S. does is going to be criticized. Whether it speaks on human rights, it's going to be criticized uh, by those within Iran, including human rights activists and the Green Movement. If it doesn't speak on human rights, it's going to be criticized uh, by people in Iran and the United States. If it pressures Iran on the nuclear program for sanctions, the United States is going to be criticized. If it doesn't as much, it's going to be criticized by allies. So I think you, you're asking a very difficult question. If the U.S. takes the lead, then again, it looks like um, it is interfering in Iranian affairs. And the Iranian government can claim, well, uh, the United States criticizes us for human rights. Yeah, look at what's going on in that way. And this is going to happen pretty soon. The Iran is going to criticize the United States or claim that the United States is trying to suppress uh, the Bahraini protest movement. So I, I don't think there's an easy answer. And we have to uh, recognize that although Emphasizing human rights is important. It has to be taken. Uh, and, uh, that action has to be taken in tandem with other U.S. policies, whether coercive or through engagement. To mention engagement, I want to give you a quote from um, President Obama from his acceptance speech in Oslo for the Nobel Peace Prize. He says, "Let me also say this: the promotion of human rights cannot be about extortion alone. At times, it must be coupled." with painstaking diplomacy. I know that engagement with repressive regimes lacks a satisfying purity of indignation. But I also know that sanctions without outreach, condemnation without discussion, can carry forward only a critical status quo. No repressive regime can move down a new path unless it has a choice of an open door. Now, in the case of Iran, so far, engagement has not been particularly um, uh, fruitful for humans. But is engagement threat to advancement of human rights in Iran? Is it helpful or is it perhaps even necessary as it seems like Obama was in the game? I want to hear what Sarah has to say on this. I certainly don't think that uh, um, engagement in itself is wrong or bad. I think engagement is good if the message is consistent. Um, there is absolutely a value of sitting across the table and exchanging views and explaining why human rights uh, is a priority and why Iran's record is a problem. And that has to be part of engagement. I mean, I think that's always been our message. And when we urge Japan, which actually has, believe it or not, a human rights dialogue with Iran um, uh, in its sessions to actually raise specific issues, specific cases, that's an important part of engagement that can have an impact. Um, when uh, Brazil, which has had engagement with Iran on specific human rights cases, uh, uh, has that engagement, I think it makes a difference and it's important. Um, but you can't have engagement if uh, engagement is just a substitute for brushing things under the carpet. That's not real engagement in any way. Or if human rights issues are not even raised. Or not exactly not on the table, which is, I think, what was the product of the, the failed uh, efforts at a multi party dialogue with Iran on nuclear weapons about six, seven years ago. Yeah, I don't think uh, engagement is a threat to uh, policy of promoting human rights. Uh, engagement is not a magic solution because I don't think the Iranian government is very interested in uh, achieving results uh, or achieving a compromise for engagement. I think engagement poses a threat uh, to the Islamic regime in Iran more than anything. Uh, but I think it's important to have a uh, means of communicating, not just with the Iranian government, but possibly the Iranian population. This, this is a country that's going to matter uh, to the U.S. Uh, 
whether they're new for programming to this one. Uh, so we have to look beyond the new carrier on and see how the U.S. can maintain some sort of uh, productive relationship with the Iranian government and Iranian people. And I think that's why engagement uh, is important in that regard. And as it is emphasizing human rights, and to a certain extent sanctions, I think sanctions can be counterproductive, but if you highlight uh, the abuses of uh, the Iranian government, if you name individual revolutionary guards, commanders, uh, if you shame specific figures also, that has an effect. Now the question of engagement, I think it really depends on who is the party that's doing the engaging. I think it's much more effective if it comes from the United Nations. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights or Special Rapporteur from the UN is the person who is engaging the Iranian government. It's much more difficult for the Iranian government to dismiss that person as being a proxy or a puppet of some foreign power. Um, but generally speaking, I think you know, if the international community, the United States in particular, raises the question of human rights with the Iranian government and actually, again, sort of identifies names and says these are the individuals that we are concerned about. That has, I think, a, um, Sarah and I were talking about this last night, and I think we perhaps slightly disagree, but I think naming names helps the human rights um, um, uh, political prisoners who are, who are human rights champions are in, 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 and so it has a direct consequence, a very positive consequence for the, for the lives of those people who are in jail at the moment. So in that sense, I think engagement, raising the question of human rights, I think matters, but I think it's most effective if it comes from perceived impartial parties, such as people who are affiliated with the United Nations. Sarah, why do you disagree? I, I don't disagree. I mean, okay, sorry. Is an individual. I guess yeah. we would to what extent Iran yeah. actually cares, and I think that when, when individual cases are raised, and I think uh, Ali Esfandiari's case is a perfect example of why focus on a particular individual does matter in Iran and does get the person released more quickly than they would otherwise be, or treated better than they would otherwise be. I know that uh, Ali Mirmayan, who was in prison briefly in Iran, said specifically that when his jailers told him that his case was being discussed um, in the international, they were, you know, Amnesty, New Rights, or were naming the name, it made a difference to how he was treated. Uh, people knew they couldn't just do whatever they wanted. What I think it doesn't affect is the overall system or pattern of abuses. You know, there were 6,000 arrests uh, after the elections. Um, we can't have a list of 6,000 names, unfortunately, that's going to affect that. Um, it's not going to affect you know, the ongoing restrictions on speech and assembly. It's not going to affect the ongoing attacks on demonstrators. It's not going to affect the ongoing attacks on religious communities, whether Sunni or Sufi or, or Baha'i. So that's really different. So how are those best addressed? Well, they have to be addressed as systemic issues. They have to be highlighted by a special repertoire who systematically <coughs> documents uh, and, and shows the pervasive pattern that this is not against particular individuals. It is sometimes, but that it is a war on Iranian society. I mean, that's basically what the government has been doing. This is a mass campaign to silence anybody and everybody, no matter how non-political their issues might be, whether they're members of teachers' unions, whether they're members of bus drivers' unions, people are being arrested and detained and threatened and intimidated and harassed and silenced to a degree that I don't think you've ever seen for a very long time. And uh, the dimension of it, the extent of it, the breadth of the government's attack on its own people is really astonishing. Uh, it, it, and it, it compares to you know, what we've all been horrified uh, by what's happening in Libya, and we've all been horrified by what the Egyptian government tried to do uh, in uh, uh, Egypt, but also the abuses that finally were focused on in Egypt with respect to torture, with respect to uh, uh, laws that uh, restrict speech and assembly and association. Those are also the realities in Iran. And the government is actively enforcing them in a very, very vigorous way. I just wanted to add, you know, um, one of the distinguishing characteristics of the political prisoners that are in Iran is that they overwhelmingly come from a section of society that deals with the question of the transference of or the dissemination of information. In other words, journalists, um, intellectuals, people who are engaged in uh, ideas, and also human rights activists. I haven't done a comparative study. But if you look at the number of people that are in Iranian jails, they overwhelmingly, the regime is very sensitive and paranoid over those people who are independent-minded intellectuals, who are human rights activists, and who are journalists. And that speaks to the internal crisis of legitimacy that the regime has. I mean, for all of the you know, weaknesses of the reform movement uh, and the green movement, one area where it's very strong is, it, in my view, the green movement has effectively won the battle of ideas in Iran. 
Iran regime cannot sustain public and open debate over its internal human rights record, over the record of the Iranian regime over the last three years. It's fearful of a public free exchange of ideas. Hence the high level of censorship, the jamming of satellite technology, it, because it knows it can't win that debate. You know, at the time of the reform movement, um, it was pretty clear that reformist newspapers would sell out, you know, in the first few hours of the morning, while well, the official regime newspapers would, 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 would not put out. So, because people would consume those, those are the ones that were courageous, were daring. And um, the fact that all that the Iran has high levels, high numbers of intellectuals and um, journalists that are in jail speaks to this internal crisis of legitimacy that revolves around the question of ideas and the dissemination of information. That's the regime is weak, it's paranoid, and it's trying to you know, suffocate society. Uh, and I think that is deeply insightful in terms of the internal crisis of the legitimacy that the regime is facing. Going back to the issue of engagement, I think, and particularly when you put it in the context of what's been happening in Egypt and in Tunisia and what's been going, it's going on right now in Libya, um, there are several different theories, conclusions, observations that can be made. And one of it is to see that in a society like Iran that has been very closed off, has been under sanctions, that is not well integrated into the international economic structures, etc., it in many ways was easier for the government to clamp down on protests. It was easier to close down the internet. Whereas in a society as Egypt, which is far more integrated, it's a tourist economy, you close down the internet, you close down the entire country. It didn't have the same options available to itself. It brings forward, and then you also have the Libyan case, which is obviously extremely isolated, and look what they're doing. But it brings forward some of the fears that I think that exist about how any engagement would take place. You have the case in Iran, which there's been very limited engagement. You have the case in Egypt, in which there was engagement, uh, but the United States for quite some time was very happy uh, with the Mubarak regime. And then you have the case of Libya, in which the engagement was solely on the nuclear issue, which then deprived the United States the, on Libya, no, on Libya, with the engagement that did take place with Libya and was only on the nuclear issue. It managed to dismantle the nuclear program, but it did absolutely nothing to address any of those other issues. And then we have the result of that. How can <coughs> any future effort, which I assume is going to be inevitable at some point, because it doesn't seem like any of these problems can be resolved with some, without some dialogue, how can one ensure that that dialogue does not end up falling into any one of these extremes? I think it's very difficult to ensure that because, quite honestly, U.S. security interests dictate that we talk to the Iranian government, and we have to talk to the Iranian government that rules Iran today, and that's Ayatollah Khamenei, it's Ahmadinejad, it's the Revolutionary Guards. Uh, we can say that uh, that the Green Movement has won the war of ideas in Iran. That may be true to a certain extent, but they're not making decisions. In Musad and Kari, we are not making decisions on the nuclear program. And the only people we can talk to are official Iranian government representatives. I think an important uh, thing to keep in mind is that we, we still have to maintain outreach to the Iranian population as much as we can. But I think even that's very challenging, given what the Iranian government is doing, trying to uh, request the flow of information to Iran and cut exchanges between the two countries. So quite realistically, this is a government we have to deal with uh, for now until things change in Iran. But if you deal with it only on the nuclear issue, you end up with a situation. Great. Yeah. I think the, the answer to that is that you can't leave it in the hands of politicians to ensure that the question of human rights gets addressed. If you do it, if you leave it in the hands of politicians, you're going to get a Libya scenario. Just remind me, we're in the U.S. Congress. Right. Well, <laughs> I realize that. Um, um, uh, there's politicians and then there's politicians. I'm talking about the good politicians and the bad politicians. There's a clear, clear distinction there. But I think the point here is, is that, you know, if the role of global civil society is the role of organizations such as Human Rights Watch, of organized, you know, citizens who care about this issue, put it on the agenda of their national governments to make sure that the discussion is not simply over the question of nuclear weapons, but also the question of human rights and democracy um, gets addressed as well. I'm going to open it up to the floor. And, uh, give priority to members of uh, staff and the media for any questions that they may have to the panelists. So I have a question about um, the bilateral dialogue um, that's taking place between countries like Japan and Iran. And I wonder if this dialogue is part of what's happening, but it's private. And I wonder how do we get 
countries like Japan and other countries that are concerned about the Iranian situation like South Africa and India to really start making this a public dialogue because I think that's going to be key. Thanks. Uh, I don't think we would succeed in getting Iran, uh, Japan to have a public dialogue on human rights uh, in Iran or to change its private dialogue into a public dialogue because then the dialogue would end. Um, I think that's how Japan would see it. But certainly um, with respect to Japan and you know, India and South Africa and Brazil, um, they can and should be lobbied. They have uh, parliaments, they have governments, they have civil societies they are sensitive to their own reputations. Uh, I think the uh, uh, recent stoning case, the woman was going to be uh, executed, played hugely uh, in, in Brazil and was something of very, very big discussion in, in Brazilian papers. Um, we have to reach out to those governments to pressure them, just like we will reach out to the U.S. government and, and to EU governments to pressure them to talk about human rights issues in a public way. Um, I think that's different from a private human rights dialogue that we want to encourage to continue because it's better than no dialogue uh, at all, um, but they, they, they need to be addressed directly. Yeah, yeah, on, on the question of the linkage between the Israel-Palestine conflict and the struggle for democracy in Iran, I was simply conveying the view of one prominent human rights activist within Iran, saying that if this issue of Israel-Palestine can be resolved, it would be a huge boon of support for the internal struggle for democracy in Iran, because it takes away a key propaganda um, 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 mechanism of the Iranian regime that wants to constantly exploit and externalize its problems by focusing attention on external aggressors and regional aggressors, in this case um, Israel and the plight of the Palestinians. Um, yes, you know, you're right in terms of Iranian protesters are, um, are saying that they are upset with the focus on the Israel-Palestine conflict, they want the focus to be on Iran, but nonetheless, um, um, the perspective of I think prominent human rights activists such as Akbar Ganji and others feel that that issue, the Israel-Palestine conflict, does bolster and does fuel Islamic fundamentalism in the region, and if it can be resolved, it advances the cause of democracy in Iran. I tend to agree with him, and I think that's where I see the linkage uh, taking place. I, I would caution between caution of uh, causing the, or creating these linkages. I don't think the Israeli-Palestinian issue respectfully has anything to do with the human rights situation in Iran. I would argue that most Iranians, although they may sympathize uh, with their co-religionists and Palestine don't see that issue as affecting their lives very directly, that they they care about issues of housing and employment and human rights abuses and uh, torture, jail, jailing. And so um, I, I think we need to treat human rights uh, issues in Iran as a very distinct issue because Iran is a big country, has 70 million people, and to a large extent what happens in Iran doesn't necessarily flow from what's going on in the region. I mean, you might have uprisings in Tunisia. Egypt, etc. But what's going on in Iran, in Iran is unique to Iran. Yeah, but just let me interject here on behalf of Nader because I think that he's making a different point and, and I would tend to move it. This is not about uh, human rights abuses in Iran having anything to do with the Israel-Palestine conflict. I think we all agree, I think Nader, that they have nothing to do with the human rights abuses in Iran. What they have to do with is giving Ahmadinejad a propaganda tool to talk about the Israel-Palestine conflict and present himself as a champion of the Israel-Palestine conflict across the Middle East, across the Muslim world, so that in opinion polls, he ranks up there um, with other professed uh, champions of the Palestinian cause and gains legitimacy and gains distraction and gains support. That's all this is about. Take that away from him. So it's not that one has to happen in order for human rights abuses to be addressed in, in Iran. They won't be. Um, but take that propaganda tool away from him is what a lot of people are saying. You can't just take that propaganda. I mean, he's going to have propaganda tools no matter what we do. It's not, it's not something that's within the U.S. reach to, 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 to take away. I mean, there's so much going on in the region. Again, um, I, I would say that that would be very counterproductive to link that issue with what's going on in Iran. And this is something the Iranian government has to take advantage of, I agree, but it's not something that needs to be solved before you can tackle the issues in Iran. But I, 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 I don't think that's the point that Sarah is making, and it's certainly not the point that I'm making. I think the point simply is, is that if that issue were to be solved, um, it would help advance the cause of human rights and democracy in Iran. Again, this is coming from leading human rights activists from within the country. That's what they're saying. It's not, it's not necessarily what I'm saying. Um, and I think one of the lessons just, just, just you know, from events over the last two months, 
as the, there is a regional ripple effect. What happens in North Africa and Egypt does affect, you know, the politics of the region. I mean, the Green Movement was revived as a result of these uprisings. And so there is, a, I think, a regional sort of connection here in terms of um, the politics of what happens in neighboring countries and its ripple effect in Iran. Um, and so that's where I see the linkages taking place. Um, um, I mean, there's a lot more to say on this, but I don't think we're really talking, uh, I don't think we really, really disagree. I think we're just sort of talking across purposes here. <coughs> hey, uh, good morning. Thanks, Rita. Patrick Garvey with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Staff. To put a finer point on the previous question you asked on, on engagement, um, obviously the committee over the past couple of years we've had the very distinct question of whether to send an ambassador to these places, um, Libya, Syria. Iran maybe next. Do we or don't we? And where do you guys come down on that? Obviously in Libya we said, okay, it's, it's, it'll be easier. The administration made the case that it's important to send an ambassador. They've come clean on, on uh, WMD or engage them on human rights when we get there. It's easier to do it from inside the country to call, to be a truth sayer from inside than it is from the outside. So I'd like to hear quickly from each of you how you come down on that question. Thanks. I think it's important to have diplomatic representation in any country. Uh, with Iran, I think uh, not having a representative there doesn't really serve U.S. interests. And I don't think the Iranian government wants any sort of intersection or embassy uh, in Tehran because it doesn't uh, meet its interests. But if we did have uh, diplomatic representation, that helps us reach out to the population, uh, be informed or more informed of what's going on in Iran. Uh, arguably, having lacking a diplomat in uh, Damascus has impeded our ability to uh, communicate with the Syrian government. And I think any, in any given country, having diplomatic relations doesn't mean you accept the regime or the system of government. It means that you have a way of representing your interests. And so this is something that the Iranian government um, doesn't want. And the fact that it doesn't want any sort of diplomatic time means it's a good thing. Having it is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I would tend to agree. I think, you know, all, all uh, efforts to raise the issues of concern and to promote, uh, I guess, interests um, would be important. But, um, for example, the new ambassador in Syria, the U.S. ambassador here, whom I recently met with, you know, if the, the, the propaganda tool of the Syrian government about the importance of resolving uh, regional issues is also going to be the only item on the agenda with respect to Syrian-U.S. Uh, relations, then I'm not convinced that it will be. Uh, particularly productive because I think that's just a mechanism for obfuscation uh, by the Syrian government in particular. Um, and so to ensure that the ambassador does a real faithful and honest job of raising all of the issues that are important to the U.S. government, including the internal human rights situation in Syria, um, then it would definitely be a value. Yeah, I think the question of sending a U.S. ambassador to Iran is, um, is it sort of misses the point in terms of what the obstacle is in terms of actually having diplomatic relations between um, the United States and Iran. I'm of the view that the, the main obstacle lies within Iran itself um, because the Iranian government actually benefits from not having diplomatic relations. If you follow what's been happening in Iran, uh, I mean, really since, since, since the beginning of the revolution, but much more in the last year and a half, Iran blames all of its problems, politically and economically, on the foreign policy of the United States. Um, and it benefits from constantly complaining that it's because of U.S. machinations, that we have these domestic uprisings, that we have economic problems. Um, if you were to have a U.S. ambassador there, it makes it much more difficult for the regime to sort of blame the United States for trying to promote internal insurrection, because then you would have uh, what you would expect as a normal diplomatic relationship. If there was a problem, you'd call the ambassador, you'd resolve them. Um, so I think we're a long way away from sort of having um, a U.S. ambassador in Iran. I would support it largely because I think having a uh, U.S. ambassador in Iran um, would, I think, um, make it much more difficult for the Iranian regime to then blame all of its problems on the United States, and it would, in that sense, advance the cause of democracy. You would have all these Iranians lining up to get visa. That, that doesn't look good for the regime if yeah. there's a huge line snaking out of the embassy. Yeah. But on that point, I, um, I heard a person from the U.S. government also say that on the first day, the Iranian go government would look very bad if there was a very long line. On the second day, the U.S. may look very bad because very few of them would get visas. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Laura. Okay. 
Verian with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. My question is regarding the Mujahideen al Khalq. There are increasingly louder calls in Washington that the NEK's designation as a foreign terror organization be lifted, arguing that the friend or the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Um, on the other hand, reports suggest that their human rights record is not so spotless, um, and that actually they're immensely disliked by the Iranians across the spectrum, not just the hardliners in power, but also the reformists that have been demonstrating. So if you could speak to the situation and perhaps give us your assessment of possible consequences should the designation be lifted. Thank you. Yeah, can I, I'd like to answer that. Which uh, um, organization are you with? Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee. That's what I thought. See, this uh, just highlights the fact that, um, in my view, how the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee is so completely out of touch, completely out of touch with domestic Iranian reality. I mean, the majority in the Khalq are not a serious organization. I mean, even to waste time discussing it just reflects the disconnect that exists in the U.S. Congress with the domestic reality in Iran. The majority in the Khalq are viewed universally in Iran as basically an appendage of Saddam Hussein's army. They're a personality cult. They have zero support except for maybe a handful of followers who live abroad. And the fact that the U.S. Uh, Council on Foreign Relations is actually giving credence to this group and is seriously discussing integrating them into sort of U.S. foreign policy as a way of advancing relations to Iran highlights the fact that, um, you know, one of the problems here is the domestic debate in this country with respect to U.S.-Iran relations. Um, my employer, the Rand Corporation, wrote a book. I didn't work on it on the Mujahideen al and I just recommend you take a look at it. And it, it describes the movement pretty objectively. Um, I, I would argue that it's, it's not a very popular movement in Iran that has very limited support outside of Iran. Uh, its objectives are not very clear what it wants to do with Iran if it could take power. Uh, it's not a democratic movement by any means. Uh, even former members have described it as undemocratic. Uh, so I, I don't think it would help U.S. interests to uh, remove the MKO from that list. Uh, it could actually complicate our policies toward Iran. Uh, I, I guess uh, Human Rights Watch doesn't take a position on their designation on the uh, uh, terror list, um, but I guess just to uh, 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 agree with the, the commentaries, I mean, I think it's, it really would open up the U.S. to ridicule uh, to have any kind of association um, with the MEK, particularly because of its utter irrelevancy and bizarreness. Um, and the fact that a, a, a number of, I guess, former government officials were recently trotting around giving speeches on their behalf and earning money uh, from the MEK is, is, is farcical and, and uh, you know, you know, it should be on. You know, it should be parodied on some Iranian talk show or something pretty pretty soon. Um, what I would say, though, is uh, we did a, an investigation on Mujahideen and Khalq's practices uh, in Camp Ashraf in uh, a, a Iran, where um, the Mujahideen and Khalq was uh, stationed with a, a fairly sizable militia uh, for for many many years, protected by uh, Saddam uh, Hussein's government. And what we documented were extensive practices of uh, uh, torture, uh, mock executions, a few cases of killings uh, against Mujahideen and Khalq members uh, who wanted to leave the organization, which I think was correctly uh, uh, characterized as cult-like in its practices of requiring utter uh, submission by their members, separation of children from their parents, and this is of their own membership. Um, and so I think it has a real dubious record as as possible saviors of the uh, Iranian people. Um, to, to, to that, but just to add to that, we've also advocated uh, for um, uh, the, the, the help for Mujahideen Khalq members who, once the Saddam uh, government ended, lost their protection uh, and, in fact, came under threat uh, from the new government uh, in Iran and from, uh, and from Shia militias in particular um, because of their role uh, in uh, uh, um, uh, being aides to uh, Saddam's government in Canada carrying out uh, attacks on Iranians, um, and so we've urged that they be granted uh, asylum to the extent that they are not themselves complicit in uh, uh, crimes and atrocities. Last question to call for this panel. Uh, I'm Tom Gibson, Senate Banking Committee. I'm just curious um, to get the U.S. travel that's restricted, so we want to see that applied much more broadly.
Yeah, I just want to echo that. Um, you know, there's, there's much to criticize in terms of past U.S. policy toward Iran, but I think the recent initiatives to target and to name those individuals who have blood on their hands, to sort of publicly name them and shame them and try to restrict their um, financial transactions, I think is a huge step um, in, in terms of the, the struggle for democracy in Iran, and one that I think, you know, human rights defenders and, and pro-democracy activists in Iran um, welcome very much, even though if they don't say so openly, I know those types of policies be, are, are, are really celebrated and welcomed because they focus the issue on human rights and they target those individuals who are responsible for human rights violations and it makes it much more difficult for them to continue to perpetuate their, their, their activities inside Iran. So I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a welcome move and something that, you know, uh, someone like myself who's involved in the struggle for human rights would like to see more of uh, in terms of U.S. policy toward Iran. Are you? No. I think we actually have time for one more question before Congressman Ellison comes. Jason. Chams from the Eurasia Foundation. Uh, all of what you're saying is very nice, and uh, I think there's a consensus on what must be done with regards to human rights monitors and stuff you told us. The problem is that we've been hearing this for the last five or 10 years. Uh, I could have sat in a similar panel five years ago and the same would be said that uh, the, the, about the nuclear program and all the things you said. My question is what has been holding us back on the matter? I mean, when the first nuclear observers came to Iran, the first the initial response, the, my, my, my own initial response was that they're wasting their time. If they want to find instances that the Iranian government is violating its obligations, they should go to prisons or where the torture is taking place and all that. Five years later, the same, same thing is taking place. My idea stays the same, and your opinions on what should be done stays the same. Is this a lack of willpower, on a political willpower? Um, it, should there be more grassroots uh, activism in the matter to gain the support of, um, of governments on the matter? Is it a serious, or are there other obstacles that is preventing from, from monitors to travel, go to Iran and be pressure being put on that front? Thank you. I think things are very different, and if you're not aware that things are very different and drastically changed in the Middle East, then you've probably been asleep since January 1. Things are very different right now. Uh, it's different in terms of uh, a, a, an expanded understanding of what's possible and what's doable. There was a, a, a unanimous Security Council vote to refer Libya to the uh, ICC. It happened virtually in 24 hours. This was not possible, forget about five years ago, this was not possible six months ago. Um, there are tremendous new opportunities now, uh, A, because there's expanded political will, uh, not just in the U.S. government, I think the will has always been there with respect to Iran, but specifically a will to focus on the human rights issues. Um, there's now a will to address that among other Muslim and Arab countries. Um, there's now a recognition internationally that, that things must change, um, that policies that don't focus on human rights are missing an important element uh, of strategy, uh, of planning, um, and now is a time that forward motion can be had, which might have been lacking years ago. Um, but things are very different now. I mean, there's, there's no guarantee that anything the U.S. does right now is going to solve the problem with Iran regarding the nuclear program and the overall relationship. I think it's important to uh, emphasize human rights, but um, it's not that no one was doing anything to resolve the situation. It's just that human rights was not as important an issue uh, four or five years ago. Because you have to look at the best strategies to resolve a problem, whether they're sanctions, military pressure, uh, engagement. Uh, at a given time, one may work better than the other. And we're at a uh, period right now, uh, as you mentioned, Sarah, that uh, human rights matters. What's going on internally in Middle Eastern countries matters. But I, I would just caution that Let's not think that this is the magic solution, that this is a silver bullet. The, the problem with the nuclear program, the crisis with the nuclear program, could go on for a number of years unless the regime in Iran is uh, fundamentally transformed. And this is going to happen due to a number of factors, and not just human rights or sanctions, um, but uh, various factors. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, 
one problem has been the conversation, both here in the United States and globally, has been so um, colossally and comprehensively focused on the nuclear question that the question of human rights has never really been central. Thankfully, now it is, partly because of regional transformations in the region, but also partly because there are now domestic pressure groups. The Iranian-American community is now organized. And thankfully, you know, we have groups such as NIAC, which have their finger on the pulse of internal Iranian developments. They also understand sort of US foreign policy and are able to present these issues um, in, a, I think, a very sophisticated and important way. Thank you. If I could follow up on that. <laughs> um, we mentioned that you know, the region has changed. And I don't want to bring up the Israel-Palestine issue again. But if you're looking at it in the sense that from a regional perspective, there needs to be more consistency, et cetera, um, in order to deprive the Iranian government from the ability to make up more excuses in order for it to deflect criticism on the, on the human rights issue, um, how is the US doing in your assessment? in the region right now. I mean, we have an interesting situation in which we're discussing a potential no-fly zone in Libya, and the Saudis just uh, went into Bahrain, but it's apparently not an invasion. How is all of this going to play out? Because if it's not the Israel-Palestine issue, I'm sure the Iranian government will find a, a, another pretext or another a reason not to uh, get serious about the human rights. How is the U.S. doing right now? Well, I think, it's, 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 I think the picture is much more cloudy and muddy now because the United States, albeit belatedly, did sign on to and support the democratic revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt. I think that has been, I think, uh, a positive development that has positive consequences for, 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 for U.S.-Iran relations. Because now that the United States is no longer backing dictatorial regimes, who the Iranian regime will always point to and say, you want to lecture us about human rights? What about your sustaining of Mubarak for the last 30 years? The fact that the United States is no longer doing that. It's, it's, it's speaking the language of democracy and human rights, of course, helps you know, with the, the question of human rights in Iran. But of course, there are these other areas, like Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, that raise questions. If the United States is going to support democracy and democratic change in Tunisia and Egypt, why not in Saudi Arabia? Why not in Bahrain? And so that gives uh, the Iranian government, again, a propaganda sort of excuse to say, look, you're not being perfectly consistent. What I'd like to see, I think, I think what needs to happen in terms of the U.S. policy is I think the United States really needs at this moment a new grand strategy for its relationship with the Middle East, one that is anchored and centered in the question of democracy and human rights. And if it were, if it were to make that change, that shift, I think it would have positive consequences in many areas, but particularly in terms of its relationship with, with Iran, because then it could speak at least much more consistently with a voice um, that is, is anchored in a, in, a, in, a, in a human rights and democratic sort of position and it would be much more difficult for the Iranian regime to deflect criticism. Yeah, I think the U.S. has had no choice but to go with the flow of events. Uh, nobody predicted Tunisia or Egypt or what's going on in Libya, Yemen. Um, not one analyst I talked to a year ago predicted that the Egyptian government would fall, that Mubarak would fall. Um, and these are experts on Egypt who live there. Everybody said they're stable. So uh, it has been, I think, tough to predict events and shape policies uh, regarding things that are happening very quickly. I think one thing to keep in mind, uh, it, it's easy to get excited about uh, people power in the Middle East. In a lot of ways, what's happening in the Middle East is great. But I think geopolitical interests often trump uh, some of the events taking place. Uh, for example, our uh, interests in Bahrain are different than our interests in Libya. Um, some have argued we don't have strategic interests in Libya the way we do uh, in some of the other Persian Gulf states. So I think that, that could uh, uh, present challenges in crafting a sort of grand unified strategy because the U.S. has so many different interests in the Middle East. Chief among them is the possibility of the rise of Iranian power because of what's happened in the Middle East. I think it's too early to tell if this benefits Iran uh, overall. In the short term, it could. In the long term, I don't think it's good for the Iranian regime. But that's another consideration. Again, uh, there is this rivalry between the United States and Iran for regional power, and it'll be interesting to see how these events shape that rivalry. Last words to Leah. Uh, I think I, I, uh, I, I would sort of fundamentally question what perceived national interests there are and strategic interests there are. And I would echo uh, Nader's comments that there needs to be a deep, deep rethinking of what uh, uh, U.S. interests or global interests are uh, with particular countries uh, in the region and, and broadly, more broadly, geopolitical interests in the region. Um, but specifically to your question, I think the U.S. Uh, actions and the international community's actions
sanctions on Libya has set a very high bar, uh, a good bar, I think, the proper bar, um, but it's not going to be sustainable to pick and choose in an arbitrary, inconsistent, uh, hypocritical fashion um, when to apply uh, those kinds of measures, that kind of very strong, unequivocal support of peaceful, nonviolent demonstrators. And even ahead of Bahrain now, I think the, the issue of Yemen is particularly troubling. Uh, the conduct of uh, President Saleh has repeated lies that he's not going to shoot on demonstrators with live ammunition. Um, the continued uh, uh, two-faced uh, uh, talk about respecting uh, uh, rights of demonstrators while at the same time uh, uh, restricting demonstrations and, and violently shooting down. And, and yet, um, the U.S. government is still uh, funding, arming, training uh, Yemeni security forces. This is a, a, an unsustainable, non-sustainable contradiction. Um, we are one step removed in Bahrain, but this is not just a U.S. problem. I mean, David Cameron gave a very you know, strong speech saying, okay, our policies of yesterday were inconsistent, and that's going to change now. And so now the onus is really on, you know, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk in a way that's going to be credible uh, across, across the region and across the world. On those words, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking the panel. We are delighted uh, of the insights, the commentary that was provided. We're also delighted we have Congressman Keith.